get it started. Okay, so welcome everyone to our uh, eighth talk of the 2023 Invited Seminar Series organized by IEEE Computer Society San Diego Chapter. My name is Sudip Saha. I'm the chair of IEEE Robotics and Automation Society San Diego Chapter. I'm very delighted to co-host today's talk uh, with uh, IEEE Computer Society. And um, without further delay, I'd like to welcome our speaker, Dr. M.D. Sakebhasa received his PhD degree in electrical engineering from the University of Tennessee in 2017. Uh, Dr. Hassan is performing his um, active research on numerous subjects and focus with linear and neuromorphic computing, hardware security, and uh, semiconductor and bio um, molecular device modeling and real service tracking design. Um, so today, Dr. Hassan will talk regarding design considerations uh, about discrete time chaotic systems, digital and analog uh, uh, implementations of such systems, and its application and challenges. So again, welcome, Dr. Hassan. So we are very excited to start your talk. Thank you, Shudip, for such a nice introduction. So uh, today I'm going to give a talk on design and application of discrete time chaotic systems. Uh, my name is Andy Saki Vassan, and I'm an assistant professor at University of Minnesota. So here is a picture of University of Minnesota. Uh, we call him Paul Miss. Uh, so if you have any questions during my talk, uh, you can always stop me and ask me. Uh, but, uh, you can always ask me after the presentation is done. Then as well. so I'll be glad to answer them. So today we have I have quite a few slides. So given the constraint of time. I might go over some of these slides pretty quickly. So if you want to go in more in depth later, uh, I will provide the slides and uh, it will be provided as in the YouTube description link. So you can go into and you know, find more information there. So let me start with my talk. So the layout of this presentation is start with the motivation of this work. Uh, then I will introduce discrete time analog chaotic circuits and then some circuit design techniques that we have uh, explored in the last few years, uh, some applications of chaos, especially in the security domain, and then I will conclude uh, with the uh, scope of this research and the future directions. So basically, uh, I would first, the security part, uh, most of the focus on security research has been on cybersecurity research has been on software level security and the field of cryptography. But recently, there has been a emerging interest in hardware-based security uh, and uh, <clears throat> A kind of application that I am looking into are more hardware security. So just a simple uh, case scenario that a typical communication channel handshake scenario. And uh, you guys probably know that in uh, cryptography, you need a secret key. And uh, from Kasha principle, if you have uh, the algorithm is known to everyone. So if that key is known, then you can break the uh, crypto uh, the cipher. So the Secrecy of that key or the quality of the randomness of that key is very vital. So you, you, oftentimes it's very important that how do we, how are we generating those random numbers? So that's a very important application of chaos historically. People have explored this. So we have also explored that. So I just wanted to give this as a motivating example of what we are doing. So for example, uh, a common way of generating randomness, you guys might be familiar that any software package like MATLAB I'm showing here has a random function and you can generate a random uh, number based on that. Now, it's operating system based uh, and you know quite a few algorithms are out there. So this is a very common linear congruential generator algorithm. So the idea is that uh, if you give a seed value, then it will create a sequence of numbers and it's, it will look uh, random, though it's actually deterministic. So this is called PRNG or pseudo random number generator. And like a digital computer, this is how things are usually generated. Now to make things random, what happens is that the initial value is seeded from a physical entropy source, timing jitter, interrupts, sometimes mouse movement. So something that is stochastic and unpredictable, truly random. So, and as a result, the generated sequences will be random. So that's the idea. And the software-based method is of course flexible and open to multiple entropy source. So that's good. But usually they're slow and they require large hardware and they're vulnerable to attacks because the underlying method is truly deterministic. So people have tried to come around this that how can you build on-chip dedicated hardware 
So uh, this is an example of Intel's Ivy Bridge. They have a digital random number generator, and this is very, you know, very well designed, and they have reported this. Um, there is an entropy harvesting metastable circuits, and based on this circuit, they can generate this, you know, they need some digital post-processing on the entropy source, but the generator sequences are statistically uh, passes all the uh, standard statistical tests and all that. So they have been using this, this is high speed and more secure than operating system based systems. However, still those entropy source and uh, there are some problems is that the entropy source is limited and it's not flexible and the core RNG is still deterministic. And even the cost that it takes might be not feasible for edge computing devices like IoT because those devices are battery driven and you have very limited power budget for those things. So there is a need, especially in the IoT devices, to have a more low overhead but highly secure systems. So uh, the resource constraint systems is the kind of application domain that we are basically looking into. That in there has been a huge burst, as you guys know, that this kind of connected IoT devices, uh, the market price, uh, market share has been going steadily up, and um, there are so. For this kind of application, and it's ubiquitous, everybody is using these devices nowadays. The question is, we want low area, we want low power and low latency. Uh, it would be great if we have an unclonable design. So if you make the same copy of the same chip twice, it will not be exactly same, and the generated sequence or randomness will be different. And it will be highly secure with limited physical entropy. So that's the goal, and that's where our chaos generating systems come into the picture. So they are unpredictable. They are uh, like aperiodic. It looks unpredictable. Uh, they are simple circuit, so low transistor count. Uh, they are flexible design, so there is a reconfigurability part. And there is a butterfly effect, which I am going to explain soon, uh, which means that it's very sensitive to the initial condition. So if the initial seed changes ever so slightly, the sequence will be different. So this is kind of the application scenario that we are targeting and uh, building our systems towards. But Another motivation is uh, the main topic is the chaos. So some of you may be familiar with chaos, but for everyone who may might not seen this, uh, what is actually chaos? But what do we mean by chaos? So obviously everyone is familiar with the word chaos, but that's not exactly what we mean when we say chaos in a technical sense. So in a technical sense, chaos is a special phenomenon, is a dynamic system. So any system that changes with time, uh, scientists observe that if the system has certain level of nonlinearity, then um, under certain condition, the system appears chaotic, which means that it has two fundamental property. It has unpredictable in the sense that the generated sequence is aperiodic. There is a, there seems to be no pattern to it. It does not repeat itself. And also, it's very sensitive dependence on initial condition. So if you have a tiny change in the initial condition, initially the two outputs look very similar, but they start diverging very soon. And after a while, these two sequences generated from very similar initial condition look entirely orthogonal or entirely independent of each other. Now, this was something that was a surprise and shock to scientists in the early, uh, in the mid 20th century. Uh, it was came out of a seminal paper by Ed Lawrence, who was a scientist in MIT, uh, who reported this in 1962. Uh, and it was a uh, third order differential equation, there is a small bit of nonlinearity. And um, he showed that that system is actually chaotic. So even if the initial condition changes ever so slightly, the sequence becomes very different. And this is the plot that he became very famous. Now, of course, it looks like the wings of a butterfly. Uh, and that gave rise to this famous name called butterfly effect. So many of you might have heard about butterfly effect before. There has been a movie named on it. Uh, in the early 90s, uh, in the movie Jurassic Park, there was a chaos scientist, Jeff Goldblum, uh, played that role, and he was talking about this butterfly effect. So the idea is that uh, if a butterfly flaps its wing in Texas, it might cause a tsunami in Japan later down the road. Because if there's a slight change in an initial condition, in an interconnected chaotic system, can lead to unpredictable outcome. Now, the practical implication of this is that system like weather, which are highly nonlinear interconnected system are intrinsically unpredictable. It's not about our science. Even if our science gets very good, our sensors are very good. If the system is chaotic, there is a fundamental limitation on how long 
down to the future, we can predict. If we want to increase that window of prediction, we have to exponentially increase our cost. So things become an exponentially more difficult to predict down to the future. That was the stark contrast to the Newtonian mechanical, uh, the dream of Newtonian mechanics and Laplacian mechanics that thought that the world is mechanical. If we know the differential equation, we can always predict. The first blow was Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. Uh, and then the second blow was the, invent the discovery of chaos. That even if the system is deterministic, even if you know everything, and we know, cannot know the initial condition exactly correct, ex absolutely 100% because of Heisenberg's principle. It's not about our instruments. And then the second thing is that even if we, even our initial condition is tiny, like order like one to the power one into 10 to the power minus seven or eight off, eventually after a week or two, or maybe a month, the sequence, our prediction will be off from the actual sequence. So this is the fundamental mystery of nature that was a big uh, shock in the mid 20th century to the scientists and mathematicians and physicists became very interested in chaos theory. And uh, recently there has been a report in IEEE spectrum that how is scientific invention, of course, if scientists come up with a new insight, engineers try to use that for building useful systems. And that's where we come in. So we are trying to take this idea of chaos and see, okay, that's bad. We cannot pre predict weather for a long time, but is there something in chaos that we can use for good? to build useful system. So there has been this recent uh, report in IEEE Spectrum from Ohio State University. They are building a programmable chips secured by chaos. So they are building something that is very difficult to hack. And that's the kind of security application. So the unpredictability in chaos is bad when you are trying to predict weather, but that unpredictability can be good for security because you want your system to be unpredictable against an adversary who is trying to hack your system. So it's kind of flipping the whole model that how can we turn this bug, apparent bug into a feature? So that's kind of the motivation where we are going with this. We are trying to get this idea of chaos, build circuits that are useful with chaotic uh, dynamics and use that for hardware security applications. Now, uh, give some perspective on existing chaotic system, uh, well-known discrete time chaotic systems, uh, Three of them are mentioned here, logistic map, sign map, tent map. Uh, these maps looks like this. So there is a very simple mathematical equation. Uh, these are called discrete time as opposed to continuous time. So continuous time systems are uh, differential equations, a set of differential equation. Uh, discrete time systems are difference equation or iterated equation. So based on Xn, we find out Xn plus one and add infinitum, we keep uh, generate new sequence. Now the value of N can only take discrete integer values as opposed to continuous time. So that's why these are called discrete time. Uh, though chaos started with Lorenz's systems, which was a continuous time system, and most of the chaotic research is on continuous time system, uh, we have been exploring discrete time system because we are interested in hardware implementation and uh, discrete time systems are easier to implement in hardware, simple system. Uh, continuous time system has a topological limitation. So to be chaotic, it has to be at least third order. Uh, differential equation. You need three equations. Uh, discrete time system doesn't have this limitation. So you can have a one dimensional equation and that can be chaotic under certain uh, conditions. Anyway, so in this talk, I am going to confine myself to discrete time chaotic system. And these are existing common systems. There are a few others as well. So logistic system is like a parabola. So this is how the input and the output looks like. And as you can see, the output becomes the input. So the domain and range of this system has to be same. So this is a normalized system, uh, input and output are both zero to one. So both, uh, so these maps. Now, one problem of these maps is that if you log, look at the bifurcation diagram, so bifurcation diagram means that there is a control parameter of this system. So in this case, we are calling it C for control parameter. As you change this value of C and plot the steady state value in the Y axis, so in this case, steady state value, we are plotting 4,000 steady state values. So though it looks like there is only single value here, actually these are 4,000 value superimposed on each other. So that means that what we want to know at the steady state, what the output looks like. As, as, it, as you can see here, that initially the 
system converges on zero. Output is zero up to 0.25. And then the fixed value increases, but it's still a fixed value. And then suddenly the sequence divert, uh, bifurcates into two paths. So that's why these are called bifurcation diagram. The trajectory bifurcates into two trajectories. So that means that when control parameter is 0 0.75, the output flip flops between two values. So these are called periodic orbits. So you start with fixed point, then it becomes a period of two, then each of this period bifurcates and become another period of two. So period of two becomes period of four. And as you probably can um, suspect from here that later the period of four becomes period of eight and period of eight becomes period of 16 and so forth. And these that, in these bifurcations starts happening exponentially faster. And soon you enter into a region where the periods becomes almost infinite. That's what we call chaos. And this is the deep red region, or it's more clear, I guess, in here. So that means that the output never repeats itself. It keeps flip-flopping, but it never comes back to this original point. Of course, if you simulate this in a discrete computer, then there is a limited stage space. So eventually it has to come back, but ideally speaking, if you have infinite resolution, then the, it, it never comes back to the original condition. And this is what we call chaos. The output looks almost uh, random. So this is the chaotic region uh, as shown here. Now, uh, the logistic map, if you want to implement this chaotic map, you can do that. You can use that as a software, like a MATLAB or whatever, uh, in an operating system based, um, uh, like a microprocessor, and, or you can implement a dedicated hardware for this. So you have a very low code, hardware description language, and implement that in FPGA or AC based on that. So that's fine. Uh, once you have a mathematical equation, you can always do that. The problem is that to have enough accuracy, or we have, have to have very good resolution. So you need at least 32-bit representation of the state variable, or preferably 64-bit representation or higher. If you have even 32-bit logistic map, to have that nonlinearity that we talked about, so the nonlinearity is coming from just as x square element, that parabolic element or quadratic element. And you, that's essential. You need to have two slopes to have chaos. A monotonic function cannot be chaotic. Actually, there is a seminal work by Feigenbaum in 1978, which showed that you need to have at least two slopes. So which he called unimodal function to have chaotic property. So you need to have some sort of product type thing. And as you guys know that if you want to implement a product in a digital system where each of the component are 32 bit, the multiplayer circuit is pretty large. So just to give an example, a 32 bit logistic map, we have implemented this in FPGA board. And these are the number of N gates, OR gates and different uh, logic gates that are required to implement this thing. So that's a very hefty circuit. If our goal is to do IoT devices where very low area, low power, that might not be a feasible solution for that. So that's kind of the limitation of the discrete uh, system implemented in a digital way. And there is also like people have tried to implement this in an IC implementation using a more analog method. So instead of take the equation, they try to come up with analog processing circuit that does those. So for logistic map, they have they try to come up with an analog circuit that has the same mathematical property. So they build those circuits, but those circuits have also like highly costly and they have lots of power consumption and they have current sources that you have to build and so forth. So here are a few examples of those analog implementation of mathematical maps. So those are also not very suitable for edge computing. So there has been a recent trend it's not many people that have been doing this, but there has been some interesting work. So this started, as far as I know, with 2003, uh, there's a paper from Dudex, um, where they showed that instead of using, taking a mathematical map and implementing them in a circuit, either digitally or analog method, why don't we use a more geometric approach or graphical approach? So what I mean by that is that instead of first starting from a mathematical equation, try to see what are the fundamental quality or fundamental attribute that makes something chaotic. So from Feigenbaum's principle, we know 
that it needs to have two slopes. It has to have non-monotonicity. And the higher the slope it has, the better chaotic property to have. Can we come up with a circuit where we don't know the mathematical equation, but graphically, if we plot its transfer characteristics, input-output characteristics, it will have similar property. Maybe not exactly clean as the mathematical equation, but similar. And will that actually yield chaos? There was a very novel approach in the sense that this has also gained traction in other fields nowadays. People are trying to do what they call compute in physics or compute in memory. Uh, uh, there has been a big movement in artificial intelligence implementation in hardware as well, that instead of trying to build uh, elements which, uh, like you, you force your transistor, which basically you are using at zeros and ones, and building a complex function, if you can come up with a device or a circuit that by its very nature does that computation. So this is the idea that compute in physics or compute in hardware that can we come up with a transistor circuit or maybe emerging device, a new device that has this kind of property. Here we are seeing three MOSFET, two uh, PMOS and one NMOS. Uh, this circuit has this kind of transfer curve. It has two slopes. And they reported that they have plotted the bifurcation diagram and uh, Lyapon of exponent. And based on that, uh, they, have, they have shown that this circuit actually is chaotic. So just to show an example, what is happening here is that the output of this circuit, only three transistor circuit, we are feeding it back to the input. We can use two maps back to back in the forward path and the reverse part, same map used twice. What is happening is that uh, with only three three transistor circuit, you have a chaotic oscillator, and the generated sequence does show chaos. So here we are showing a sequence of values. So when VC is 0.25 or VC is 0.5, as you can see, when VC is 0.25, the sequence is fixed value. So it has converged into a fixed number. Then there is a bifurcation. So you have a period of two. So that the output flip flops between two values. Around 0.56, there is another bifurcation. Now it has a period of four, but it's still periodic. Around 0.9, it becomes chaotic. So right now, it in a first glance looks like periodic, but if you look closely, you will see that actually the sequence is periodic, never repeats itself. And more importantly, if the initial condition is changed ever so slightly, the initially the two sequences are almost indistinguishable, but at a certain stage, the two sequences diverge a little bit, and after a while, they appear almost independent of each other. So that's the butterfly. So based on this uh, thing, what we can do is that if we have this kind of thing, we can plot something we call the bifurcation plot uh, for this kind of analog chaotic system. And what we find out is that it is indeed chaotic after a certain value, so around 0.6 to 1. Um, Things are chaotic. Now, uh, I can go into the details later if you guys are interested, but uh, let me go into the more characteristics of this system. So, we can measure the chaos, how much chaos a system has by something called Lyapunov exponent. So, it's a widely used metric. Uh, basically, to summarize, if the Lyapunov exponent is positive, things are chaotic. If it is zero or negative, things are not chaotic. And the higher the value of Lyapunov exponent is, the more chaotic it is, in a sense that the sequences diverge exponentially faster. And if we plot this Lyapunov exponent, we have found out that the values are close to, let's say, 0.3 Lyapunov exponent. Now, for a unimodal circuit, you can prove that the ideal maximum value is around 0.69. And this is a logarithmic scale. So, 0.3 is actually not very chaotic, to be honest. And also there is a huge swath of the parameter space where things are not chaotic. So our, what we try to do is to take this circuit as an inspiration, that building analog circuit, but which will have better chaotic property. So Lyapunov exponent tells you how fast things diverge. But one thing we also want to know about initial state sensitivity is called correlation coefficient. So if you start with the same initial condition, either the initial value or the uh, control parameter, what you can do 
is to plot the correlation coefficient between two sequences generated from slightly different initial condition. And here we show that yes, initially up to 0.6 when things are periodic, everything converges. So two sequences become the same sequence. Uh, so the correlation coefficient is one. And later when things are chaotic, two sequences that seems almost orthogonal to each other. So the correlation coefficient seems close to zero, as we expect. So these two metrics, and there are a few other metrics like Shannon entropy, Kolmogorov entropy that we use in our work to quantify uh, the chaotic property of our system. But for this talk, I'll just confine myself to uh, bifurcation diagram, Lyapunov exponent, and correlation coefficient. So uh, yeah, so this is an example of uh, recent work where they are trying to predict uh, a chaotic system. This is a famous oscillator called Mackey glass chaotic oscillator. And they show that eventually, like after 30, 40 iteration, it's almost impossible to autonomous prediction of a chaotic system. So chaotic prediction uh, using a machine learning model to predict chaotic system is an ongoing problem. Uh, it's a difficult, very difficult problem, to be honest. So people are exploring this. And again, at the heart of this problem is the butterfly effect of the chaotic system. So now, uh, yeah, so I'm going to skip uh, these other metrics. If you are interested, we can go come back to this later. So now some limitation of the existing 1D maps, as I mentioned, that limited chaotic range, like how most of the parameter space is non-chaotic. Uh, the performance is not robust. So because of the analog nature uh, of these systems, if you change it ever so slightly, it can go out of chaos and that can cause security compromise and also the lack of exponent is not very high. So we want to improve upon this thing. So there are two approaches. One is you build a new circuit which has better slope and better chaotic property or you use existing maps and somehow do some signal processing and composition technique to create a better map. So the first one we, are, we have tried is called dynamic parameter control. This was based on an earlier work where they used this method for uh, digital maps. Uh, we have tried to kind of adapt from there for uh, our analog circuits. The idea is that, okay, we will take two maps. Uh, the second map has a limited chaotic range. Uh, the first map's output will be transformed. There will be a linear transformation and it will transform and uh, fix. So let me show. Uh, will always be chaotic. So we have shown this using this circuit that uh, the original seed map has very limited chaotic range. Most places it was periodic, but this dynamically parameter modulated map has almost 100% chaotic ratio, which means that uh, almost entire parameter space is chaotic, so which is good. Uh, even if there is a temperature fluctuation or some process variation, we expect it to be within the chaotic region. So that's good for our security application. Similarly, we plot the Lyapunov exponent and we found out that, yeah, indeed it is positive uh, across the entire parameter space. Another way to improve the performance of such system is cascading two maps. Again, it was uh, based on uh, in the digital domain. Uh, people have explored this approach. We have tried to adapt this for analog systems. And we have found out that if you can cascade two maps under certain condition, which we have derived in our papers, that if the control parameters are exactly identical and the output range are similar, then you can cascade two chaotic maps and you can actually almost double the Lyapunov exponent. So the first method, the parameter modulation, widens the chaotic range, which sometimes we call the quantity of chaos. And this one actually heightens the quality of chaos. So if you combine both dynamic parameter modulation and cascading, you can get a wider chaotic range with higher Lyapunov exponent. So you get both high quality and high quantity, more quantity of parameters for chaos. So we, we kind of show this using Lyapunov exponent and some other metrics that this method can be a workable solution. Now, uh, and of course we kind of showed that what are the limitations of this method? So there are certain conditions. So there have been some mistakes in the literature that we tried to correct that uh, not under all condition, it doesn't work, but under certain condition, this is a workable solution. 
Now, the application that we started with is random number generator, which seems like a perfect match for chaotic system, given its unpredictability and apparent randomness. Though its underlying system is completely deterministic. So, the method that we proposed is we wanted to have a low overhead system. So we have this very small three transistor circuit, and we have a single and cascaded map. We compare them using a comparator, and those outputs are given to a XOR circuit. Uh, we found out that a single map is not good enough, so we had to use three of them, and we had to choose the highest lie point of exponent point, and th those are XOR to produce the output. So there are three entropy sources you can think of, three chaotic oscillators, and uh, a some post-processing XORing. So very minimal overhead system. And we showed the result of this system that the sequence is pseudo random. However, uh, the result is good. Now, though when we are running a simulation, our systems are pseudo random. This is the this is another unintended kind of advantage of I mean it can be advantage or disadvantage given the situation. So the original idea of chaos was that it, it will be completely deterministic. And it is always explored using mathematical equations, which are completely deterministic. However, we are not using any mathematical equation. We are using a graphical technique using the analog characteristics, large signal characteristics of MOSFET. Obviously, those MOSFET large signal characteristics will vary from chip to chip. And they will vary for process variation, chip to chip variation, also vary for power supply variation and temperature variation. Those things are actually good things for random number generator under certain constraints, obviously, but because now what used to be a pseudo random sequence in real life when you implement this system will actually act like a true random sequence because the two times you run these systems, it will never create the exact same sequence because the temperature will at least change ever so slightly for the power supply or the process. So, and we know due to butterfly effect, ever so slight change will lead to a completely independent sequence. So the advantage of this analog circuit based random number generator in real hardware will be twofold. The first is that the minimal overhead. And then the second thing is that it will actually be a truly random sequence. At least that's what we are, like our hypothesis is. So we try to kind of show this, that why this is true. Um, this is true random sequence. So we add some random noise uh, from MATLAB, of course, that's not truly random MATLAB noise, but we generated sequences and we find out that actually, yes, that if you have very tiny amount of noise in our node voltage, then the generated sequences are completely independent. So we have tested the quality of this thing with standard. So there are some standard statistical test suits for uh, evaluating the quality of randomness. Uh, NIST is the most famous one. So we did the NIST test. I'm not going to bore you with the details now. Uh, we saw that our thing, so there are 15 tests and we have passed all the 15 tests, both for the ideal PRNG situation or more, more practical TRNG situation. The, our chaotic oscillator uh, based PRNG actually passes all the tests. So that was one thing. Uh, then we kind of modify the dynamic parameter modulation technique a little bit. Uh, instead of using a linear transformation, again, the same idea that instead of using linear transformation using mathematical equation, which needs op-amps and all these things, can we come up with a transistor level circuit, which might not be exactly linear, but we don't need exact linearity. All we need is that we will just convert the output into the chaotic range. So that was the idea. And we showed that very simple MOSFET voltage divider, like this green region shown here, can convert your voltage range to a suitable chaotic range. To be other banana, so we can we can get like uh, uh, you know. Okay, so uh, let me continue. So so we showed with NPMM uh, that we didn't need we don't need linear modulation. Non-linear modulation with a simple circuit can also do the trick. And we showed some useful result uh, based on that. Anyway, so that's one part of this thing. I'm not going to go into the details of this for the sake of time. But after that, uh, so these are methods where you take multiple maps and then combine them to build something useful. 
Uh, then we came up with this idea that why don't we do this parameterization based on a single map itself? So in this idea, based on the input, the map will be uh, the mod the parameter will be modulated and make sure that the modulated parameter is within the chaotic range. So now we don't need two maps; we just need one map and a transformation circuit. So based on that, we showed some result this year, early this year, that actually this can be done. And we have done this for both mathematical maps and for uh, our more graphical analytical analog maps. So we have done this with logistic tent and sign map, and we have shown that we can actually extend the chaotic range, this uh, narrow chaotic range of logistic map to a almost 100% chaotic range of a SPM or self parameterized map. Uh, similar, so this method is general, and can be done for any of these uh, maps. After doing the mathematical maps, we have implemented Bayesian and FPGA and verified its uh, functionality. Then we went on to the analog map, which is I, I think is more interesting, more new approach. And we have also designed analog modulating circuit to build self parameterized map and pretty minimal circuitry. So you just need additional few transistors for a voltage divider circuit, and using them you can build a self parameterized. So I'm just going to show the result and you can see here that the Lyapunov exponents are actually wide chaotic range, 100% chaotic, positive uh, in red. And so that was a promising result. Now, uh, the application of SPM again, we now used a different design for a random number generator. So previous design was based on comparator circuit. In this design, we have used a four bit ADC and we have taken the lowest significant bit because that has the highest entropy. And based on that, we use three oscillator, same exhorting method to increase the entropy even more. And the final random bits have passed the NIST test as shown here on the right. So, so these are systems which are all one dimensional chaotic system. Now, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to shift gear a little bit. So the next thing we did was two, two dimensional chaotic system. So one dimensional chaotic system where there is only one state variable is relatively less complex and can be broken. Uh, 2D chaotic systems are more complicated because it's a planar state space, space, more options for the state variable to be there. And most of the work in the 2D chaotic system world, for example, uh, famous 2D maps will be Hanon map, uh, etc. Those are all mathematical maps. So I don't know, at least myself, that like this kind of analog graphical approach has been used to be. So I think this is, uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is the first 2D analog chaotic system that we proposed. Uh, so, you know, the analog chaotic systems are useful. People have shown their things, but these 2D maps are pretty Uh, we lost the network connection. Yeah, I lost audio. Hello? Oh, yeah. Can I just repeat the last slide? I think we lost the uh, audio. Uh, here? Um, yeah. Yeah, here, yeah, this slide. Okay. So, so far I have talked about 1D chaotic system, but uh, 2D chaotic systems are more complex dynamics, but they are, of course, more hardware costly. And people have shown some implementation of 2D systems, but they are not suitable for edge computing system. So we have tried to do the same thing. Graphical approach, uh, intuitive graphical approach, simple analog hardware, transistor level design, which will have the 2D dynamics. So in this case, we have two variables, X and Y, uh, two state variables. But what we say is that we have designed multiple three transistor map circuit, multiple different topologies. So we choose two of these topologies and call them seed map X and seed map Y. What we do is we modify their control parameter. So X's control parameter is modified based on Y and Y's control parameter is modified based on X. So it's a cross coupled system. And based on that, both of the maps individually are always in the chaotic region. Our hypothesis was that then the full 2D system will also be in a chaotic region. So based on that, we have built the circuit using our Kind of previous ideas, parameter modulation, seed maps, and so forth. But we have combined in this specific topology. 
And yes, indeed we find out that the 2D system, if we plot the X and Y variables separately, they both are chaotic and not just that, they are chaotic over the entire chaotic parameter space. So this is called robust chaos because there is no break. I mean, there is a tiny little break in one of the topology here. Might be able, not be able to see this properly, but uh, it's mostly almost 100% chaotic, uh, the whole parameter space. So it is robust 2D chaos using a very simple transistor level circuit design. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first, uh, this kind of analog transistor level 2D map design. And now we are working on extending these principles into higher dimensions, like 3D and 4D, because things become exponentially more complex as you increase the dimension of the chaotic system, but try to do that with uh, minimal hardware. We're currently working on that. Anyway, so we have measured the lab of exponent of the 2D systems, and indeed those systems are positive lab of exponent or chaotic uh, across the whole region. So, in fact, I should mention that when there are two lab for, for sing, 1D map, map, there is one lab of exponent. For 2D map, there are two lab of exponent. And if both of them are positive, if one of them is positive, it's called chaotic. If both of them are positive, it's called hyper chaotic. It means it is diverging in both dimensions, which is even more desirable property. We have found that uh, some of our systems are actually not just chaotic. Uh, the first system is actually hyper chaotic. So now, one focus of ours is that extend, generalize the systems to higher dimension and make things hyper chaotic. Okay, so now uh, there is some theory behind fixed point that we used for our circuit design, but given the interest of time, I will just go into the next circuit design that we have exp are exploring the currently. So this is called uh, splits of chaotic map. So basically the idea is that all the chaotic maps we have seen so far, the lab on an exponent was 0 0.3, 0 0.25, and so forth. We used cascading and parameter modulation to improve them. But can you make a circuit that is intrinsically better, has higher slope, more steep slope? So we use some circuit design technique like common source, uh, amplifier, source follower. We have give, taken ideas from those uh, common circuit topologies in analog circuit and try to combine them in a method called split slope chaotic map. So instead of going into the details, I just want to show the final output. So this is what the transfer curve for one of these examples. I'm calling it SSM1. So this top particular topology, it yeah, it requires a few more transistors, but the slopes are much steeper. And as a result, uh, the and we have built a, quite a few of these topologies. So SSM2 looks like this. So it has two slopes, but both downwards. Uh, and then we have also generalized this to multiple slopes, so three slope circuit. So now we have three slope circuits, and the final output looks like this. So this blue curve. So as you keep increasing the complexity, more and more slopes, the lab of exponent increases, and this is kind of our final result that all the existing work, because of this analog nature and the few transistors. Their lab on of exponents were around 0.3, and it's not most of the time it's not chaotic. Our circuits are not just you know, chaotic entire, across the entire parameter space, they have a much higher uh, lab on of exponent. In fact, they are close to the ideal. So uh, the ideal is 0.69 for two slope circuit, and we are close to there. Uh, for three slope circuit, we are also close to the ideal value, which is I think around 0.97 or something. But we're pretty close there. So these are very high lab of exponent circuits with a little more transistor cost, but uh, much better. Anyway, so based on this, there are a few more extension of this work, but I'm going to skip them for the interest of time right now. Uh, so this is one thing that we have been exploring. We have also explored another topology called the four transistor topology. So only four transistor, but it has a much wider chaotic range, as you can see here, but now, I'm going to switch gear into a few other applications. So, so far, I have only talked about uh, random number generator uh, as an application, but that's not the only application that is possible for chaotic map. So, we have explored a few other applications, uh, both as uh, in my group here in BMOS lab uh, in uh, University of Mississippi, but also as a postdoc, I worked on this uh, in University of Tennessee under Dr. Garrett Rose's group at uh, Seneca. So we have explored uh, quite a few different applications. One of them was pioneered by William Dito, 
they are called reconfigurable logic gate. So since chaotic sequence, so if you can just follow my cursor a little bit, that if we go from iteration to iteration, so 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, it looks like zigzagging, going up and down, uh, chaotic oscillator value. Uh, the idea was that if we have a threshold and we say that if the output is above the threshold, it's one, and output is below the threshold, it's zero, then this circuit can be used as a logic gate. So this is kind of the idea that we use, start with the initial input value. So let's say it's a two input gate. So the inputs can be uh, zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. We have some additional padding and think of them as increasing the parameter space. Convert this digital number into an analog value. This analog value is the initial condition. You set a control parameter, VC. You start oscillating this thing, and every iteration, you compare the actual output with the reference voltage of the comparator, convert into digital again. So you start with digital. In the middle, the core of the circuit is analog. And then the output is again converted back to digital. And at, because we now have a huge parameter space, so this is kind of an equation. There are four switches that you can tweak, either the padding or the control voltage or the V reference or the number of iteration. And based on them, you can have a huge parameter space. And uh, we have found out that more, all the functions, so you can have 16 functions, but let's say the six common functions and NAND or NOR, X NOR, X NOR, all of them can be found quite a you know, significant number of different cases. So as we increase the iteration number, the number of this configuration count, we are calling this chaotic configuration count or CCC, increases exponentially. So you can build a lot of different ways you can build AND or XOR and so forth. So basically this means that you can change the configuration of these four parameters and you can convert the same circuit into AND, OR, or XOR. Not just that, this circuit is flexible, so a same AND operation can be implemented in many different ways. So a same circuit can be configured into one of the gates, and same gate can be implemented into multiple different ways. So these give us an idea, and we compared this performance with different metrics, but this gave us an idea that you guys probably have heard about the side channel analysis attack, which has become very popular recently. It's the hardware-based attack. The idea is that whenever you do a computation, uh, there is some physical leakage of information that we cannot avoid. So standard cryptography looks into the algorithmic challenges so that a hacker cannot break into it. People found out, I think it's late 90s or early 2000, uh, there was this great insight is that when Uh, again, last yeah, we lost voice. Uh, uh, I think we lost at page forty-seven. Uh, your audio is not uh, audible. Like uh, we cannot hear the audio. No, uh, it's still not. Yeah, still not hearing. No, not hearing yet. Maybe the microphone changed. Can you uh, check? To... Yeah. Now, now we can hear. Yeah, we can hear. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Then I will not use this one. <laughs> yeah, we lost uh, while you were discussing about this power side channel analysis attack. Uh, okay. Yeah. So let me let me uh, resume from this slide forty seven. Yeah. So I was talking about that there is a very uh, like uh, early two thousand. I think it became known that um, there is another way to attack a cryptographic system instead of breaking the algorithm. 
you can actually break the hardware. So the idea is that, let's say you have a key that is the secret, and based on a particular bit, whether it is zero or one, the power signature of the output is different. Or it can be electromagnetic radiation. The main idea is that whenever something is happening in hardware, in real physical world, it always leaks some information inadvertently. And if an attacker can gather those physical leakage and use the machine learning algorithm to uh, you know, figure out the secret information, then he attacks. So these are called side channel attack because these are not the main channel of operation, but this side channel leaks information. So one of the most popular ones were power side channel attack. So what we are trying to show here is that um, since chaos can be used to do reconfigurable logic gate, uh, e people have shown before that um, based on this power attack, you can attack the, you can figure out the instruction for any, any program. So basically the idea is that and or XOR, this all these different basic instruction has very different power signature. So if you look at the power signature, you can do the reverse engineer and find out the instruction. So these are called instruction attack. So similarly, there are data data attacks where you can find out a secret data. Anyway, we have done uh, instruction attack. So where we have tried to show that yes, uh, when you have normal CMOS Boolean logic. You can indeed break these systems, and as you can see, it's almost more than ninety percent accuracy. You can break basic instruction problem, and then we tried what we call cross obfuscation. The idea is that we will have multiple configuration. Each of them will do AND or XOR, but with a different configuration set for the chaotic system, because it is reconfigurable as well as flexible. Each of this configuration or each of this machine. They will do the same logics, but with a different analog underlying setup. So the power signature for AND, so if you train your machine learning attack based on the template for configuration one, you cannot break configuration two, three, four, and five, and so forth. So that was the idea. And we showed that this cross obfuscation. This is what we are calling cross obfuscation. But yes, at least if you train your things on machine one and attack machine one, you can break it in this system. So we wanted to up the MP that can we make self-obfuscation that even for the same machine, if you train the system on that machine, you cannot break that machine, right? So for that, what we want, need is that uh, AND or EXO, even them on the same machine will have very similar power profile. So you cannot distinguish between them. So we use the idea of constraint reconfigurability. So among the four tweaking knobs that we have, we figured out that two of them actually dictate the power profile and two of them are independent. So we kept the two things that are critical for power and the other two things we have tweaked to make it AND or an XOR. As a result, when you look at the power signature, AND or an XOR seems indistinguishable. So we kind of tested our hypothesis and we found out that indeed, uh, it's very difficult to classify uh, when things are chaotic uh, for AND or an EXO, and uh, the classification accuracy overall is 24%. So that's pretty good, uh, you'd say. So we have six gates. Uh, so ideal obfuscated system will have an accuracy of one over six, which is 16.67%. We are not there, but we are close. So 24%, it's pretty good. Obfuscated. Similarly, so for the sake of time, I'm not going to elaborate on the next few things. Um, I only have five minutes left. So I'm just going to summarize some of the, some of the other applications that we have looked into. So after this um, side channel attack, another application we looked into using reconfigurable logic is called logic locking. So you lock a system, uh, IC chip, so that IC can cannot be counterfeited. So you guys probably all know that there is a huge a threat about IC counterfeiting um, because most of our chips are not fabricated in the United States anymore, uh, fabricated overseas, and someone can take your IP and, you know. So you want to build a chip. If you send a chip for fabrication, you, you don't want that foundry to be able to reverse engineer the system. So you put some lock there, and the key is not known to the you know, fabric, uh, the fab people. So even if they have the whole layout, 
they cannot make the circuit work. The key will be uh, only known to the design. So this logic locking has become very popular in the recent days to prevent the supply chain vulnerability. And we have shown that uh, the same idea can be implemented using chaotic system. Uh, so basically what happens is that you have a circuit design that is the black topology here. You put some additional XOR gates or XNOR gates and the input of this XOR gates is the key that is only known to the design. So if the designer gives the right key, the system will work. Otherwise, the system will not work, basically. So, so that's the idea of logic blocking. And similarly, another important problem in nowadays is authentication of device. So each device, if you sell devices, uh, each copy that you make, you sell it to a new customer. But let's say you sell it to 10 customers. But sometimes Fab, what they do is that they take this design and build 100 copies and overbuild them and sell them. So you want authentication that each chip will have your authentication, a unique ID, uh, and then based on that, you can authenticate a device, whether it is correct. So one idea that became very popular is that physically unclonable function on pumps. So physically unclonable function means that if you have the design, but if you build the same design twice, it will not be exactly identical. It will, for the same input, it will produce completely different output. Similar to chaos, chaotic idea, the idea is that because there is a process variation in actual, when you build the actual chip, if it is 60 nanometer length, it will never be exactly 60 nanometer. There will be a slight variation. Usually we design circuit in a way so that it is robust against that variation. So even if there is a slight variation, same input, same output. Now we want the opposite. Well, what we want is that we do the same design. Each instance of that chip will have a unique response. So that slight variation of process will be amplified, right? So people have come up with many different path circuits in the last uh, 15 years uh, to do this kind of thing. Uh, these are called challenge response pair. So you give a challenge, look at the response and authenticate a device. Now, I'm not going to go into the details here in for the sake of time, but just to summarize is that we have built the systems also, which is a combination of logic locking and um, so we have a replacement algorithm so we have a any digital circuit you give me we will replace a few of these gates with a chaotic gate because chaos is very susceptible to initial condition slight process variation magnifies the output so it can be used as a puff but also to operate the chaos in a proper way we need the certain parameter that can also be the key for logic locking so we name this system parks so physically unclonable reconfigurable computing system which can do the dual purpose of logic locking and um, uh, puff basically there are still remaining challenges so for puff it has to be very reliable uh, to make chaotic systems reliable is a big challenge uh, so that can be a future direction for i think we can explore but uh, these are some of the interesting things another thing i won't have time today that we are exploring is that for image encryption People have been exploring uh, chaotic system to do image encryption. Uh, so that's something, another thing that we are exploring in our group. Uh, so now I will uh, conclude my talk here. Uh, just to, so I'm just going to the conclusion slide. So basically the takeaway or the final thing, I think I have at least, uh, I've tried my best to convince that this is an interesting subject, which has uh, quite a few promising applications. So the main takeaway that I would like my audience to at least uh, remember from here is that traditional engineering education has focused on linear systems, linear signals and systems. Uh, nature is nonlinear and many of its interesting features cannot be appreciated without delving into nonlinearity. So that's a pure scientific question, uh, like understanding nature. And then also in recent years, this nonlinear and chaotic dynamics have been interest of to not just mathematicians and physicists, but engineers are also interested to take those insights and build useful system. So I believe that there is a vast uncharted territory waiting to be explored. It's an exciting field for today's uh, electrical engineering and computer science graduates. And I will invite the audience to take part in this journey to unravel nature's mystery is a scientific question, but also build next generation secure computing system as an interesting engineering journey. So I would conclude my talk here. And I'd like to take any questions.
Thank you, Dr. Hassan. It was a wonderful talk. I learned a lot as well. Um, any question uh, now from the audience? Okay, I guess that's... Um, yeah. If there's no question... Uh, there's one question in the chat. Someone asked if you, I mean, said, uh, June, don't uh, say thank you so much. Can you share the slides? Yeah, I mean, we'll share the recording if the slides are shareable. Sure. I mean, I will can. share the slides with Dr. Mahabu and mm -hmm. you can put it in the YouTube description. Mm -hmm. uh, this it, time around, I'm actually going to share the slides, Dr. Mahabu. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, G. Neum said thank you, Dr. Hassan. Uh, so, one thing I have a question. So, you mentioned uh, uh, actually, there is another question. Let's, let's look it up first. Could you please talk about the effects of imperfections in the bifurcation plots? Yeah. So, so yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there's something that I did not have time to go into. But uh, it's a very interesting question. So as I mentioned earlier, so there can be many different types of imperfection uh, when we are talking about uh, analog circuit design. So it can be PVT variation, like process voltage temperature variation, or it can be noise. So and those are important for analog chaotic circuit design. So for example, just to give an example, so this is a bifurcation plot. Let's say, right? So for nominal condition, we are doing a simulation. And this is the bifurcation plot result. Even if the, but actually when you fabricate this, uh, the geometry of the transistor will not be exactly that. It will be close. CMOS is very mature technology now. But slight change, what means is that we have tried this actually. Uh, and that was a big part of the uh, logic of fuscation work. It was physically unclonable. So we have tried Monte Carlo simulation across process variation. And what we found out is that this bifurcation, this chaotic region shifts around. It moves right and left. Right, so it's not uh, it change. It is very dependent on that thing, and that's one of the motivation of us designing a better system, better chaotic system with higher slope, so that the whole range is always chaotic. Even so, there is some margin of error. Even if there is some variation, it will still remain chaotic. In these old designs, the problem is that okay, nominally you are chaotic here. But slight temperature varies, the chip heats up a little bit, you go outside of the chaotic region. So all these imperfections uh, do have an effect on analog implementations that we are kind of um, championing. Uh, I have always, I've just talked about the advantages of analog systems, but of course, the digital systems have this advantage that they are more robust. That's why digital is the winner, big winner. Uh, yes, digital takes more power and space and all that, but digital is more robust to any imperfection. So those digital chaotic maps have this advantage is that, yes, you get almost predictable bifurcation diagram every time you run it in different chips. For analog circuit design, we have to be much more careful. I see. So I think there are some uh, additional questions from uh, IC, if I'm not mis not, not mispronouncing. So, uh, do you have to do any calibration? How often? Is there any way to like maybe self calibrate to make this thing work? Probably along that line. Yes. So, I mean, depending on which application you want to do. So, for random number generator, one advantage is that you do not necessarily have to do any calibration. So, I mean, we want unpredictability. So that's that's okay, but if you want to use it as a logic obfuscation, right? In that case, you are using reconfigurable logic gate. Now, logic gate has to be predictable. If you design a circuit for AND gate and it becomes an OR gate suddenly, uh, that's not very desirable. And that was actually a big challenge in the later half part of my talk. I was talking about mm -hmm. so this was done in my postdoc years. So uh, the graduate student Aisha and um, uh, Mojumdar. They were uh, working on this problem, and one of the big challenges we faced was that um, how to make this. We want 
both worlds, best of both worlds. We want things to be predictable, yet unpredictable for from a attacker's perspective, for an adversary's perspective. We want things to be obfuscated from an attacker's perspective, but for a user's perspective, it has to be reliable and predictable. To match both these conditions is difficult. We we proposed a calibration scheme. So when a chip comes from the foundry, we'll have a calibration scheme where there will be a test badge. So there will be a test chaotic oscillator. It will be characterized by the user or designer who is selling the, the vendor. They will characterize that chip and that's the chip one. They will characterize that, okay, each parameter value, which gate it produced, and or X or whatever. So they'll have a list, kind of a database for chip one. For chip two, it will be a different list because of the physical unclonability, uh, the same design, but slight variation in process will produce a different chip. Uh, so we have to have a separate list for that. It's a good thing. That's why we can use it as a path, but it's a challenge because for each of them has to be characterized separately. And uh, yeah, you have to you know, create the key, the key for each of these chip, uh, uh -huh. each of the copy of the same chip will be different, different keys. Now, it's a, it's a more challenge on the vendor so we uh -huh. selling this chip, if they takes this approach, they have to, you know, additional investment for the characterization step. The advantage is that from an attacker's perspective, let's say a hacker hacks chip one. Uh, in traditional logic locking design, if you know the key for one, you know the key for all. But in this case, each chip has unique keys. So even if you uh -huh. break one key, you don't break all the uh i think uh, the last question from aisha is that what is the speed of the universal logic gates uh speed of the universal logic gate yeah the the, the i mean max speed yeah i mean it's a work in progress so we are trying to make it as faster as possible of course I mean, so the last five years we are making it faster and faster basically I think we, I have a delay plot somewhere, I don't remember where, but anyway, just to give some perspective. So modern submicron device, we have been designing this in 45 nanometer technology. So let's say in 45 nanometer technology, I'm just saying this off my head. So it might be a little, I might be a little bit off, but to give the order of magnitude, uh, state of the art, a logic gate using Boolean logic, like conventional CMOS design, uh, let's say it's one picosecond fast, like uh, 10 picosecond fast. Uh, our design will be one nanosecond. So we are still like 10 to 20 times slower than the traditional systems. Of course, because traditional system just gives the end gate directly. Mm -hmm. We are doing multiple iteration and those iterations are also more complex than conventional digital logic. The advantage is that our system is morphable. It can be reconfigured into same Topology, same chip can be reconfigured into multiple different uh, logic gates. So we have the flexibility advantage, but as far as speed and power is concerned, yeah, both speed we are 10 to 20 times slower, and power I think also we are 10 to 20 times more power consuming than traditional MOS gate. But the advantage that we have is that you don't have to replace all your logic gates with uh, these systems. So we have actually a methodology. I did not have time to go into this, but we showed that to get the advantage of logic locking, what we propose is that we just replace a few of these gates with chaotic gate, and that was enough. And in fact, we had a method for, uh, yeah, where is that? We actually have a method of doing the replacement based on testability. I don't know. Somewhere is somewhere in there it should be there. But oh yeah, I got it. So we have a method that how many, so if you have 100 gates, how many of them you need to replace to get very good logic looking performance? And we first did random replacement. So and we found out that around 50% replacement give you ideal performance. Uh, okay. And then we found out that we have a testability based replacement. So testability is a concept that comes from 
a tradition of testing and verification of chips. So it's called, it's a combination of controllability and observability. So we, based on that, for a particular topology, we create a rank, testability one, testability two. And then based on that, we replace the most priority, the gates that are most significant for this particular network. And we found out that around 20 to 30% replacement is good enough to get very close to the ideal 50% Fleming distance. So, uh, so what I'm trying to say is that even if a single chaotic gate is more power hungry than uh, a normal gate, you don't have to replace all your logic gate to get the functionality. You can yeah. end 20%. Uh, yeah, I actually, uh, I have one question. So you mentioned that, uh, uh, like you started with the 1D chaotic system, chaotic system, and then showed about 2D and talked about higher dimension. What's the motivation for going towards higher, higher dimension? They seem to be more and more complex, right? Right. So basically, ultimate underlying 1D dynamics, uh, 2D dynamics is more complex than 1D dynamics. So from an attacker's perspective, uh, it's relatively easier to break 1D. Uh, the reason we started with 1D is obviously it's easier to build in hardware, it's low cost. 2D will obviously be a little bit higher cost than 1D. But 2D, as far as complexity is concerned, 2D has the potential to be like the complexity should go exponentially, where the cost should go linearly. So it should be exponentially more harder to break 2D systems. But analyzing 2D system or like uh, the higher dimension that you go, analyzing them becomes difficult, designing them will become difficult. And of course, the cost is also a little bit higher cost. So it's a more challenging problem, the higher dimension you go. But uh, it might be a requirement for security. It's an arms race kind of. So you design some things, people break it, then you want to make it more complex to so that, you know, so, so that's the need. If there is a defense application or some application where the security requirement is very strict, you might want to go with a 2D or 3D system, even if it costs you a little more. Okay. Um, I see. Yeah. So, I, for example, if I have two one D systems versus one two D system, I, I mean, is the is a a two D chaotic system less costly than having two one D system, or like, is there any way to use like multiple one D systems to achieve the same effect as a? Yeah. Yeah. So. Um... They are not same. So that as far as cost is concerned, uh, two one D system uh, and one two D system can be theoretically equivalent cost. In fact, two D might be a little bit more cost. But a, uh, a truly two D system is something where each output. So let's say the input is x and y. The state variables are x and y. Mm -hmm. Then output, I start with x n and y n. And the next state is x n plus one and y n plus one. A truly two D system will be x n plus one is a function of x n and y n, and y n plus one is also a function of x n. I see. Let's call these two function f and g. So these two functions are coupling the two variables. So if so, it's like a differential equation. If you have two yeah, independent, yeah, 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 and then a couple yeah, system. Couple system is more complex. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it was very interesting. Surely, yeah, I, I yeah, t totally out of my domain, but <laughs> I mean, yeah, I don't work on this, story, but yeah, the overall talk was very fascinating and interesting. I think. Uh, any other question from the audience? Okay. Yeah. If not, then I think, yeah, yeah, we can call it a day. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Hassan, again. And uh, it was a great talk. And uh, I hope we will talk, uh, we'll again contact and communicate, and we'll have more talks from you in next year. So thank you, everyone, for joining as well. So we can uh, conclude. Yeah, thank you for your kind invitation. I had a wonderful time.
Well, thank, like to thank everyone in 